Hello wrestling fans, I am the Pro Wrestle Machine, and this is June 24, 1996 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Dick Murdoch Bio, one of the best pay-per-views of all time put on by WCW. Best of the Super Junior Tournament. Tons more. By Observer Staff. Wrestling Observer Newsletter. P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California 95009-1228 June 24, 1996 It should come as no secret that many pro wrestlers aren't anything like what they are portrayed on television. Others take from their natural personality and do things to exaggerate those qualities to become their wrestling personality. In the case of a few, what you see on television as far as personality is actually the real deal. Dick Murdoch was almost exactly like the character he portrayed on television. Sometimes charming, sometimes obnoxious, oftentimes hilarious, always a character, always the center of attention. He was a legendary storyteller, whether they were true or not was usually irrelevant, and everyone who met him had their own set of stories to tell about him. He was one of the great workers of his era. He was a legitimate household name in Japan, having spent more time in Japan than any foreign wrestler in history with the exception of Stan Hansen, Abdullah the Butcher and Tiger Jeet Singh. While he was a star virtually everywhere he went, he was the type of a performer whose talents were more appreciated and even raised more awe among his fellow wrestlers than to most of the fans. Although his looks, physique and facial expressions made him a classic heel, he actually achieved his best success as a drawing card in places like West Texas and the old Mid-South Territory, as almost a classic kick-ass character babyface. Hart Richard Murdoch passed away suddenly of a massive heart attack shortly after midnight on Friday night slash Saturday morning, technically in the wee hours on June 15. He was 49. He had promoted and wrestled a show the previous night at the old Amarillo Sports Arena, the same building he practically grew up in as a child watching his father, Frankie Hill Murdoch, in a legendary area feud against Dory Funk well before anyone called him Dory Sr. Murdoch had a backer and was set to run a series of shows this summer at the sports arena called Blast from the Past Wrestling with this past week's show being the third of the series. The night of his death, he was competing in a rodeo doing bull roping as part of the Corps Team Roping Association, also in Amarillo. As perhaps America's number one consumer of Coors Light, it was customary to go out after the rodeo and drink with the guys, well, actually it was customary for Murdoch to drink, all day most any day, but he told his wife that he wasn't feeling well, and wanted to go home. She found him dead on the couch at their home in Canyon, Texas, near Amarillo later that evening. It was not an unfamiliar story in Amarillo, as a generation earlier, two other legendary area wrestlers and tough guys, Mike DiBiase and Dory Funk Sr., both of whom were still active, passed away in Amarillo from heart attacks. The news was a shock to everyone in wrestling, however apparently Murdoch's blood pressure in recent months had been sky high, and he had gained even more weight. When he wrestled his final match in Japan on May 23, he looked almost like an exaggerated version of himself. Funeral services were held on June 17 in his hometown of Canyon, Texas. Dory Funk Jr. knew Murdoch, who was born August 16, 1946 in Amarillo, from when Murdoch was four years old and Dory was eight. Murdoch traveled around the circuit with his father from the age of five and the two would see each other at the matches and see their respective fathers duke it out in the early 1950s. The first incarnation of the Funk-Murdoch-Amarillo feud was so heated that during one calendar year, they headlined the Amarillo Sports Arena a small old-time wrestling all that was legendary worldwide among wrestlers for its atmosphere, in singles matches 30 of the 52 weekly shows. Murdoch was a wild kid even then, running around ringside, throwing chairs, wanting to hop the rail, and basically being rambunctious and misbehaving. Those traits never left him, as he was famous within wrestling for people who went out with him for doing, well, almost exactly what people who watched wrestling on television would assume Dick Murdoch would do after he had a few beers in him if he was outside the ring exactly what he looked like on television to the fans, a beer-drinking crazy redneck, he was exactly the opposite inside the ring. Despite having a physique, which the joke was, looked like a great balancing on two sticks, at about 6 foot 3 and weighing anywhere from 260 to probably upwards of 300 in recent years, Murdoch was among the best workers of his era, certainly among the top 10 in the United States during the late 70s, and probably one of the most versatile workers of all time. If need be, he could exchange holds on the mat in an entertaining manner. As a brawler, he was right up there with Stan Hansen and Bruiser Brody as the top of his era. Despite not looking the part, when he wanted to, he could go up for drop kicks, leapfrogs, and flying head scissors. He was equally effective as a performer as both a babyface and a heel. 
Many people talk about the night in Knoxville in 1994 when he wrestled Bob Armstrong and Armstrong held him in a headlock for 23 straight minutes and Murdoch knew so many tricks of working in and out of a headlock that they kept the audience entertained. And when one throws in aspects of working such as timing, both timing of moves and when to do moves to get maximum response out of them, crowd psychology and facial expressions, he could best be described as a worker the caliber of a Terry Funk that put himself at less physical risk than Funk did. He probably threw the single best work punch in the business, and probably one of the best shoot punches as well if need be outside the ring. And he appeared to have phenomenal stamina, at least considering how his physique looked, working many 60-minute singles matches during his career, including a few all-time classics at the age of 40 in the Mid-South Territory, in world title matches against Ric Flair. Others would say it wasn't so much he had great stamina but simply a combination of knowing when to pick his spots, and simply having the guts to work through the exhaustion barrier, of course, he was all that on his good days. When he was in the mood to clown around, which was a lot of the time, particularly as he got older, he could clown around and get the crowd going as well as almost anyone. And when he was in the mood to have a stinker of a match, he was strong and tough enough that his opponent wasn't about to be able to get him to do anything. And that was the enigma of him. He was strong without looking strong. Agile while looking anything but. And he was a great natural athlete, without any formal athletic background. One story wrestlers from West Texas love to talk about revolved around a West Texas State alumni football game in the 70s. During his wrestling career, Murdoch was always billed as a former football player from West Texas State, a college that produced numerous wrestling stars such as the Funks, Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody, Dusty Rhodes, Ted DiBiase, Tully Blanchard, Manny Fernandez, Tito Santana, and Bobby Duncan. That was one of the few things about him that was a work. Since he was from the Amarillo area, it just naturally fit when he worked out of the area since the college built up a mystique in some territories because of the number of successful pro wrestlers who came out of it, and also because he regularly teamed with Rhodes during the early part of his career and in many ways was best known in certain parts of the country for his longtime association with Rhodes, who was the Southeast's number one attraction at the time. The fact was, Murdoch never even played football in high school. Anyway, being the BS artist and tough guy that he was, he talked his way into an alumni game claiming he was a former middle linebacker at the school, and played in the game, and the story in town was that he was so good that they thought he was too rough on the football players. He was just a large coordinated guy with a lot of guts, whose athletic talents were in unique events such as the ability to hit a sign on the road with a beer bottle every time out while driving at 75 miles per hour. While he was successful almost everywhere he went until the inevitable slowdown that comes with age, he gained his most fame and made his biggest paydays in Japan. As several wrestlers of today have lucked out financially by being at the right contract stage at the greatest time ever to be a top wrestler in America, Murdoch was in much the same position in Japan. In the early 80s, New Japan and All Japan were at war. Murdoch had been a top star with All Japan from his debut in 1973, capping it off by winning the United National title, one of the three titles that comprises today's Triple Crown, from Jumbo Tsurida on February 23, 1980, and dropping it back two weeks later. At the time Antonio Inoki of New Japan was doing a promotional gimmick of creating a tournament to determine the real world championship, to be called the IWGP title, with a worldwide tournament. To get his new title over as something more than just another promotion creating a world title, Inoki tried to create the illusion, sound familiar, that it was open to wrestlers from different companies and to get this illusion over, top stars that had never worked for New Japan before or had never worked in Japan before needed to be involved. And in particular, wrestlers that had worked for rival All Japan needed to be involved to give it the credibility he wanted. New Japan then rated All Japan of its of its top foreign stars, Murdoch and Abdullah the Butcher, to get the tournament idea over, with Murdoch debuting on August 21, 1981 with his new employer, with a very lucrative by the standards of the time contract paying him $7,000 per week and he remained one of New Japan's top regulars until they stopped using him in August of 1989. With New Japan, Murdoch was always one of the top pushed foreigners, but promoted at a level below the megastars such as Hulk Hogan or Andre the Giant, more on the level of people like Adrian Adonis or Masks Superstar, who were top workers and solid attractions for New Japan. These were the types who would work the six mans on top most nights of the tour, occasionally work programs back and forth with Tatsumi Fujinami, the group's number two babyface, and get a rare singles main event and lose to Inoki including once in the finals of the 1986 IWGP Singles Tournament. It was in Japan that Murdoch's second most famous tag team was born, with Adonis. The two were similar in many ways. Unique physiques that belied their ability. Good charisma but not big drawing power charisma. Excellent workers. Both made their national reputations originally the same way. 
Murdoch by tagging with the super charismatic Dusty Rhodes in Michigan and more so in the AWA, being the team workhouse to compensate for Rhodes' weakness as a worker. Adonis the exact same way, only with Jesse Ventura. Built as the North-South connection, the two became the top foreign tag team with New Japan during the television glory days of the promotion when it was on network television in primetime every Saturday night doing monster ratings. Because of him always being in a top match, his unique character nicknamed the Super Rodeo Machine and a television visibility, it made him a household name in Japan even though he was never in the top draw position, and kept his career alive in Japan until his death. Murdoch and Adonis went to the finals of the Madison Square Garden Tag Team Tournament in 1983, New Japan's counter to All Japan's traditional World Tag League event in December, losing to the dream team of Inoki and Hogan. As was traditional, Vince McMahon Sr. attended the final nights of the tour and it wasn't long before the two were put together in the WWF as well, with vignettes being done of two totally opposite personalities being put together. They captured the WWF tag team titles from Rocky Johnson and Tony Atlas at TV tapings in April 1984 in Hamburg, Pennsylvania, and held them until January 21, 1985 losing to Barry Windham and Mike Rotundo. While holding the belts, they continued to work regularly for New Japan as well, including going to the finals of the 1984 MSG tournament, losing to Inoki and Fujinami. Since they no longer held the WWF World Belts as a team, New Japan created a new tag team title, the WWF International Tag Team Titles, the predecessor of today's IWGP Tag Team Titles, and Murdoch and Adonis were made the first champions, although they almost immediately dropped the titles to Fujinami and Kengo Kimura. Murdoch left the WWF in 1985 to return to Bill Watts Mid-South Wrestling, where he had his greatest success as a babyface in the late 70s as the territory's top star, partially due to politics as the WWF-slash-New Japan relationship was falling apart and Murdoch was a bigger star in Japan than in the WWF while Adonis stayed in the WWF, put on an enormous amount of weight and did the gay gimmick. At that point Murdoch formed a tag team with Superstar. After Adonis left the WWF and dropped some weight in 1988, the duo was put back together in Japan, including losing an IWGP tag title match to Ricky Chashu and Masa Sider just two weeks before Adonis' untimely death in an auto accident. New Japan in the mid-80s was a crazy place to be with all the various styles blended together. It was the infancy of what is now called shoot style, with the likes of Akira Maeda, Yoshiaki Fujiwara and Nobuiko Takata educating the fans to a new style, which few foreigners could do and even fewer in those days wanted to learn. Yet it was Murdoch, who picked up the exchanging submissions almost immediately and was one of the few wrestlers who'd worked the new style, and had the respect of the younger wrestlers as a tough enough guy who would have no fear in punching them in the nose if anyone tried to get cute. He had the most powerful six-inch punch, said Jim Cornette, who liked Murdoch so much when he managed him in 1987 for Jim Crockett Promotions that he frequently brought him into Smoky Mountain Wrestling as a secret weapon on major shows. I could hold my tennis racket six inches from him and he'd throw a punch that you wouldn't even see that would knock it clear across the room. He was the strongest guy for how he looked. However in a work situation, Murdoch had the rep for throwing the best looking punch in the business, but his opponent would never even feel it. I can't think of anyone today to compare him to in that he could get something out of anyone, said Cornette. I'd book him in matches and put myself at ringside just so I could watch. He was hilarious. Murdoch's first tour of Japan was for Yoshinosato's old Japanese wrestling alliance in February of 1968. He continued with that promotion through 1972, when, working for the AWA, he and Rhodes toured for the International Wrestling Enterprises which was affiliated with the AWA, during 1973. He switched to Giant Baba's All Japan Pro Wrestling in 1973 and remained there until the New Japan Jump. After New Japan, Murdoch worked his way around the indie scene touring for FNW, IWA, Wings, and War with his final match in Japan being on May 23rd for Pro Wrestling Fujiwara Gumi where he faced the company's namesake in the main event at Karakuen Hall. Tokyo Pro Wrestling owner Takashi Ishikawa had planned to sign Murdoch this year build him back up for a Legends feud with Abdullah the Butcher. In all, Murdoch made 54 tours of Japan. It was in Mid-South Wrestling where Murdoch picked up the guise of Captain Redneck. Billed as a former U.S. Marine, which was also a work as Murdoch started in pro wrestling as a referee right after his 1964 high school graduation and never looked back. He did a redneck gimmick as a heel tag team with veteran killer Carl Cox, Herb Gerwig. Cox, who was 17 years older than Murdoch, did the teacher-slash-student gimmick with him, with the two capturing the old United States tag titles from Danny Hodge and Jay Clayton. Next came the inevitable split-up and what was probably the most famous singles feud of his career. 
Murdoch's babyface push came largely from area booker Bill Watts, who at the time had not yet taken over the territory run by former wrestling legend Leroy McGurk. Watts was the top babyface and wanted to slow down, and figured Murdoch, doing the patriotic former Marine redneck gimmick would work great in the Arkansas, Oklahoma and Louisiana Territory. From late 1975 through mid-1977, Murdoch was the area's top babyface, largely feuding with Cox in what are still thought of today as some of the greatest matches ever in that area and the feud climaxed in several matches that drew huge crowds of more than 15,000 at the Louisiana Superdome. It was in this guise where Murdoch picked up the brainbuster, Cox's finisher, as his pet hold. The strange part is sometimes amidst the wild brawling in the blood, in matches that fans watching say looked as close to real as any matches they ever saw in the territory, Murdoch would at various opportune times tell a joke and try to crack Cox up. He was forever clowning in the ring, sometimes doing his curly of the Three Stooges cell job. Often in Japan when working with an American, he'd loudly tell jokes in the quiet arenas in the middle of his matches that most of the fans couldn't understand. The teacher-slash-student angle was one of Watt's favorite as he would regularly recreate it as a way to push a new babyface, and the role was recreated with Murdoch in the teacher role for Ted DiBiase, with the eventual turn, leading to Murdoch returning home to Amarillo. Murdoch had already been a top draw for Dory and Terry Funk as an occasional headliner in Amarillo. He grew up in the city, where his father had been the longtime top heel. He started out as a referee there right out of high school. One time during a match where Sputnik Monroe was facing Duke Myers, a big cowboy got in the ring to go after Sputnik. Monroe kept his cool and started shadowboxing and entertaining the crowd, but judging from the size of the guy, he probably would have killed Sputnik if they locked up which would have been an embarrassment to the wrestling business in that era. Murdoch, in 18, jumped in front of Sputnik and beat the hell out of the way and hurled him out of the ring. That was probably not the first time something like that happened, and definitely not the last. People remember that in the late 1970s, when Murdoch was a regular either on top or second from the top in St. Louis, flying in from whatever territory he was working, that Sam Mushnick could count on about once a year getting a phone call early the next morning after a show about a fight in the bar. Usually the story ended with one punch being thrown, by Murdoch, and the fight was over. At that point in time the biggest draw in St. Louis was Dick the Bruiser, and many credit wrestlers like Murdoch and Harley Race with their great working ability for keeping Bruiser mystique and drawing power alive in main events long after it should have left him. While Japanese lore has it that Murdoch's first professional match was against Bob Geigel in Kansas City in 1965, he probably had some matches on the road in the Amarillo Territory before going up to Kansas City and later into Tennessee where he formed a tag team with Don Carson. The general consensus was in 1965, after working nightly and training under Geigel and Pat O'Connor, he became a good worker before his 20th birthday and was the 1965 NWA Rookie of the Year. He reprised his father's feud, working against both Dory Sr. and Terry in Amarillo, and occasionally facing Dory Jr. when he was NWA World Champion. Since Amarillo was never a big money territory, Murdoch would come home for a while, but then depart, but kept building his local name over the years until he became a top drawing card. When he was away and would come back, we'd book him against whoever the top guy was in the territory, and we'd always figure on a drawing a sellout, remembered Dory Jr., who along with Terry owned the Amarillo territory after the death of their father. After the big run in Mid-South, Murdoch, Bob Windham, Blackjack Mulligan, and Mario Savoldi bought the Amarillo Territory from the Funks and ran it for three years, largely around Murdoch and Mulligan. The first year was good. The second and third weren't. The group lost so much in the bad years that it resulted in the end of the long history of the Amarillo Territory. It took years even with Murdoch earning a six-figure income working part-time in Japan and being a top star in the US in the interim, for Murdoch to get out of the financial mess the last two years of the Territory created for him. Before Captain Redneck, the Super Rodeo Machine and the North-South Connection were the Texas Outlaws Dirty Dick Murdoch and Dirty Dusty Rhodes. The two came together shortly after Rhodes broke into pro wrestling after playing some semi-pro football. The two first went into Detroit in late 1969. Patterned after the duo of Dick the Bruiser, an all-time legend in Detroit, and the Crusher, being two large brawling bullies, the two won the area's version of the NWA World Tag Team title from Ben Justice and the Stomper. After that they went into Florida for the first time, then to Australia, and achieved their greatest fame during a several-year run in the AWA as the number two heel tag team behind Nick Bockwinkel and Ray Stevens. Their role was basically as a stepping stone team, in that they would put over a babyface team, which would give the team credibility and earn them the title shot at Stevens and Bockwinkel, usually on the show the following month. The two heel teams eventually met in a series of matches where Rhodes' babyface charisma first became apparent. 
During this period the two had a second run in Florida. After Rhodes hit it big as a babyface in Florida in 1974, Murdoch would frequently come into town for short, and occasionally long stints, usually to help Rhodes in a feud, then to turn on Rhodes out of jealousy of Rhodes' popularity. During the AWA run came the movie, The Wrestler, a nearly totally forgettable film produced by Vern Gagne except for the bar scene where a karate guy, played by the late Harold Ajab Tosh Togo Sakata, kept making fun of Rhodes and Murdoch until they responded with a campy bar fight scene ending with Togo and a Japanese cohort being slammed through a jukebox. Murdoch also had a cameo doing wrestling scenes in the Sylvester Stallone movie Paradise Alley. While flying from Los Angeles with Dory Funk, where the movie was being made, to San Francisco, where both were scheduled to appear in a Roy Shire Battle Royal at the Cow Palace, the two were in first class drinking and telling loud stories and basically being obnoxious and annoying everyone on the plane, while apparently being oblivious to everything around them. As the plane landed Dory noticed that right next to him on the plane was Bob Hope. He and Murdoch then started talking to Hope, but when the plane door opened, Hope probably did the quickest sprint at his even then advanced age out the door. Perhaps his most memorable angle of the 1980s came in late 1985 on one of the single greatest one-hour wrestling television shows ever. Ric Flair came into Mid-South Wrestling as NWA champion to work at the Irish McNeil Boys Club against Ted DiBiase, who was then a heel. Murdoch at the time was a babyface, and had just lost the North American title a few weeks earlier. Still, fans knew of their past teacher-slash-student relationship. Murdoch came out and asked DiBiase to step aside and let him get the title shot. DiBiase refused. Murdoch posted DiBiase, who bled like crazy and was carted off. Bill Watts did a legendary interview warning fans that a pressure bandage has been put on DiBiase, but he was going to wrestle, but if the bandage came off, he was warning everyone that it would get very bloody and talked about DiBiase's guts and just taking the match and comparing it to the lack of guts of Roberto Duran in the Nomos boxing match with Sugar Ray Leonard. Of course DiBiase bled again, came close, but ultimately lost the title match when he took a bump over the top and basically collapsed on the floor due to loss of blood. After the match, Murdoch gave him two brainbusters on the floor, turning himself heel and DiBiase babyface, and allowing them both to leave the territory because of Japan Tag Team Tournament commitments Murdoch being suspended, DiBiase billed as suffering a potential career-ending injury. Murdoch and Watts always had something of a love-slash-hate relationship. Watts would bring Murdoch in and Murdoch, when motivated, got the job done in the ring and on the mic. But Watts was a disciplinarian and Murdoch lived by his own rules, which were basically doing what he wanted when he wanted. One week, trying to make a point, when Murdoch was on top and the territory had a big money week, Watts find Murdoch, who arrived late a few nights and no-show to date everything he was to earn that week except one dollar, and gave him a one dollar check to get his attention. The final breakup occurred in 1986, one year before Watts sold the territory to Jim Crockett. Murdoch was taking another West Texas State football alumnus with a wrestling family background, Kelly Kineski, under his wing, in real life, not in the storyline. He felt Watts was treating Kineski unfairly, particularly when he fired Kineski as part of a numbers crunch. Murdoch spoke up because in firing Kineski, Watts kept two bodybuilders with no wrestling talent because he felt they had more long-term potential. The two bodybuilders were Jim Helwig and Steve Borden. Murdoch liked to tell the story, whether true or not is probably another story, that during a run with Watts, the two were together at a bar after the show and Watts was reading the Bible. Murdoch asked if he really truly believed in it and Watts said yes. Then he asked him if he really believed in the Ten Commandments and Watts said yes. Then he asked him what about the one about thou shalt not steal. And as Murdoch's story went, that's when Watts said, you're fired. In recent years, Murdoch had continued to work smaller promotions in Japan and worked independent shows throughout the cities that comprised the old Mid-South Territory and in Texas. He had moved to Walsenburg, Colorado for a few years where he operated a bar, but in 1995 moved back to Amarillo and was married once again. He had a passion for steer roping and in his heyday as a wrestler had little time to do it, so he had more time in recent years. In early 1995, he got another shot with a WWF, appearing in the Royal Rumble and working some house shows as a manager for Bob Backlund, largely at the request of Razor Ramon. Ramon was doing a house show program with Backlund, and figured that it was impossible to have a match with Backlund, so instead he could work around Backlund using Murdoch, the master at controlling a crowd, to control the match from the outside. Apparently nobody had any idea of what to do with him and he made his share of enemies complaining through all the television tapings as they continued to bring him in, pay him and not come up with anything for him to do. So eventually he wasn't brought back. 
when it was suggested to bring Murdoch in as a manager for John Hawk, when it was decided to give Hawk the Stan Hansen gimmick, because who could teach someone to be Stan Hansen better than Dick Murdoch? But Dutch Mantle wound up getting the nod. Pay-per-view shows come and go with a few new ones every month. Whether they are good or bad, because there are so many, few leave any kind of a lasting impression. However, the WCW Great American Bash show on June 16th was one of those rare exceptions. It's hard to believe that a WCW show could be compared with shows on the level of the J Cup, but this show, for Angles, was the single best pay-per-view show ever. For wrestling, it was very good as well. Even though there were several good to excellent matches, there were three angles that stole the show. Steve McMichael turned on Kevin Green and became the fourth member of the Horsemen. Kevin Nash choke slammed Eric Bischoff off the ramp and threw a table after Scott Hall punched him in the stomach. After Chris Benoit beat Kevin Sullivan in a Falls Count Anywhere match that wound up in a bathroom, Arnold Anderson hit the ring and teased turning on Benoit, but instead turned on Sullivan, which got an amazing crowd response. The show drew about 9,000 fans, 7,323 paying $123,406, a figure which has to be a disappointment considering the amount of hype aimed at the show and that it was in Baltimore, which has traditionally drawn well for major WCW shows, like the Pancrase show two days earlier. The pay-per-view had a bad break going head-to-head -head with the Chicago Bulls losing games 4 and 5, which is why they hyped the replay of the show so heavily on Nitro. Dusty Rhodes, who was nowhere to be found until minutes before the show went on the air, came up with his strongest performance as an announcer on the show. It's always easier to be a good announcer when the show is clicking, and Tony Schiavone was good as well, although there was a spot where he was hyping the bash at the beach and brought up last year's fiasco, saying that there were 100,000 fans at the show last year. At that point his nose grew to about the size of the state of Montana. Speaking of announcers, Pedro Morales, who does the Spanish language broadcasts on pay-per-view for WCW, was injured after the show. They had set up several gimmick tables for when it was time for Bischoff to take the bump, so in case he missed one, he'd hit another. When Morales was coming back from the broadcast, he accidentally stepped on one of the gimmick tables, which collapsed and he fell four feet and landed on his elbow. His elbow wound up all swollen and his hip, knee and back were all injured in the ball, although he refused to go to the hospital. Rhodes mentioned the death of Murdoch both at the beginning of the live main event show and again at the start of the pay-per-view. Rocco Rock, Ted Petty, pinned Jerry Sags, Jerry Saganich, in 146. It was scheduled as a tag match with Public Enemy vs. Nasty Boys. Rock came out by himself and said Johnny Grunge was injured and asked for a singles match and for the other guy to go to the back. So Brian Knobs went to the back. The match was short and not all that good, ending when Grunge came from under the ring and hit Sags with his cast to lead to the pin. Grunge's injury was actually a broken thumb suffered in the June 7th match in Buffalo. VK Wall Street, Mike Rotunda, Pin Jim Powers, James Manley, with a Samoan drop in 307. Jim Duggan pinned Disco Inferno, Glenn Gilberti, in 209 with a clothesline in a total squash. Ric Flair did a great interview at the end of the TV show. The only reason I bring this up was because he did his bright lights, that city's routine and when he said big cities, he looked down list top and everyone had to bite their lip to keep from cracking up. 1. Rick and Scott Steiner, Robert and Scott Reed Steiner, beat Ice Train, Harold Hogue, and Scott Norton in 1029. The crowd, which was dead during the pregame show, got really into the Steiners. The fans booed fire and ice although they didn't play heel at all. Scott and Norton traded dropping each other on their shoulders at bad angles. Scott Steiner was worked on for several minutes with Norton using both a shoulder breaker and Fujiwara armbar on him. Rick tagged in doing stiff clotheslines and a German suplex on Norton. The two teams traded near falls with saves with a Japanese-style finish until Scott did a Frankensteiner on Norton for the pin. Very good Japanese-style match but until finishing move itself wasn't taken right. I can't believe they'd even think of trying to have a guy the size of Norton even try to take a Frankensteiner. 3 stars. 2. Conan Charles Ashinoff retained the US title pinning Elgato, Patrick Tanaka, in 6.03 after a powerbomb and jackknife cradle pin. Gata was billed from Cabo San Lucas in Mexico this week after the angle last week was that he was from South America. I guess once we cross the border and they're all foreigners it really doesn't matter. There were boring chants. Conan used a lot of submission moves that the American crowd still doesn't understand since nobody has ever put them over and the announcers never get them over. Highlight was him using a sunset flip over the top rope to the floor turning into a powerbomb on the floor which looked dangerous. Two stars. 
Sting then did an interview for his match later in the show against Steve Regal. The only reason it's noteworthy is because he was doing a really decent interview until he lost his train of thought. 3. Diamond Dallas Page, Page Falkenberg, retained the Lord of the Rings ring pinning Marcus Bagwell in 939. Page tried to get heat early by getting on the house mic and knocking Carl Ripken. Because Bagwell has such a lame gimmick few people are noticing what a great worker he's turning into. Page's matches are all well laid out. The only weakness of this match is that Page tries in spots to sell like Terry Funk. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad and it was the latter toward the finish of this match. Bagwell went for the fisherman suplex but Page hooked the ropes, then Page hit the diamond cutter for the pin. The crowd popped big so his finisher is getting over. Two and a half stars. 4. Dean Malenko, Dean Simon, retained the cruiserweight title pinning Rey Mysterio Jr., Oscar Gonzalez, in 1750. This was the best wrestling match on the show and an excellent technical match. It wasn't the right match to do in that it was a great Malenko-style mat wrestling match. Mysterio Jr. showed he was versatile enough as a worker that he'd be put in a position where he's not doing Mexican style and still have an excellent match. However, it was Mysterio Jr.'s debut and he's got far more potential to get over and they should have to his stylistic strengths. Someone whose potential niche if he gets over like Mysterio Jr. as being more of an attraction star, like a reverse Andre the Giant, and the kids and ethnic hero can't do any jobs until they are over or fans won't believe in them, even as little as jobs mean nowadays. No matter how much charisma Chavez had, if he had lost his first two big matches on American pay-per-view, a 145-pound guy whose main appeal was to Mexicans would have never become for a time the biggest box office draw in boxing. Anyway, his Tiger Mask potential is already done to casual fans because they saw him in his debut against what fans perceive as a mid-level guy and he lost twice. After this match and even more after Nitro leaves one with the impression he's a kid with a few cute moves but no threat to anyone important. Malenko did a great job working on Mysterio's left arm with various slams and submissions. However, by 10 minutes in, fans were getting tired of it even though it was all solid and well executed. They picked up for Mysterio's big moves, including a springboard somersault to the floor, a springboard dropkick and a Frankensteiner off the top before Malenko got the pin using a power bomb with his legs on the ropes. Most in WCW that had never seen him before and were skeptical of him seeing how small he was when he showed up wound up raving about this match. However, he showed less charisma than I've seen of him in any match in a long time. 4 stars. 5. John Tenta pinned Big Bubba, Ray Trailer, in 524 with a power slam. They were put in a bad spot following the previous match. Bubba worked harder than I've seen him worker in a long time. But Tenta can't get over as a face and with all the TV time devoted to this angle nobody cared. After the match Tenta cut a little off Bubba's beard. 1 star. 6. Chris Benoit pinned Kevin Sullivan in a Falls Count Anywhere match in 958. Just for the record, all the bruises on Benoit and Sullivan's face on Nitro the next day were a result of makeup applied and not because they actually hurt each other in the brawl. They finally made Benoit a star and Dusty Rhodes was actually hilarious in his commentary when the two were brawling in the bathroom. The brawl in the bathroom, with real people in there doing what real people do in a real bathroom, was great, particularly Sullivan slamming the bathroom door on Benoit's head. It was missing Benoit flushing Sullivan's head down the toilet. They traded using a garbage fan. Finally they came back to the ring, but not before Benoit rolled down the stairs. Sullivan kicked Benoit low and crotched him on the guard rail. Benoit crotched Sullivan on the guard rail. Benoit threw a table at Sullivan. Finally Benoit put the table on top rope and stood on the table and superplexed Sullivan off the top for the pin. After the match Benoit continued to beat on Sullivan until Anderson came down and threw him off. They teased Anderson turning on Benoit, but instead Anderson and Benoit put the boots to Sullivan, and the crowd went totally nuts. Bubba, Max, Meng and Barbarian came out but Anderson and Benoit were long gone. Anderson then did a great interview after the match talking about he, Flair and Benoit being a united force. 4 stars. 7. Sting, Steve Borden, beat Steve Regal, Darren Matthews, with the Scorpion in 1630. Regal has been on a roll on the mic of late. This match was for the most part Regal's one-man show and what a show he put on. When it comes to all facets of doing a realistic-looking totally worked wrestling match complete with some shtick and interviews, this guy is probably the most complete performer in the company. Sting made the big comeback after selling almost the entire way. Three and one half stars. Eight. Ric Flair, Richard Fleer, and Arnold Anderson Marty Lunda beat Steve McMichael and Kevin Green in 2051. These four and Terry Taylor, who trained McMichael and Green with help from Flair and Anderson, 
deserve an enormous amount of credit. The idea of putting two guys in their first match, even against Flair and Anderson and with the angle and with notoriety, and going for 21 minutes sounds like a recipe for a disaster. But Michael and Green did a great job considering their obvious limitations. They weren't exactly Jun Akiyama in his first pro match, but they were both a hell of a lot better than much praised debuts of Lawrence Taylor or Oleg Tokhtarov, or for that matter Booty Man, Jim Duggan, or even the Hulk Hogan of today after 15 plus years in. They laid out a tremendous match and nobody got off the page. We've seen plenty of pay-per-view matches with main event caliber performers against each other nowhere near as good as this. We've certainly seen many matches when outsiders are brought in that wind up embarrassing, and also they use the outsiders to make the wrestlers look like fools. This match was put together in a way where the football players got to look impressive using football skills to knock the wrestlers around, and even use a double figure four and green used a suplex and both football players used high backdrops, but not at the expense of making main event talent look incompetent. The fact the crowd was largely pro Flair and Anderson, but that there were enough fans cheering the football players because of Randy Savage and Bobby Heenan that the audience popped for every bit of offense by anyone made things easier. The angle didn't hurt either. At one point woman raked McMichael's eyes. Then Deborah McMichael and Tara Green, the respective wives, boy is this going to get heat? But people were calling here that didn't pay close attention to parts of the show and thought Kevin Green's wife was Steve and Deborah's daughter, started arguing with woman and Elizabeth, then ran away from them with woman and Elizabeth chasing them to the back. Finally after Anderson clipped Green's knee, Flair used the figure four. Savage attacked Anderson, which brought out Benoit to attack Savage, and they worked on Savage. At this point Green reversed the figure four while Deborah McMichael, in an expensive dress, came out with woman and Elizabeth and a suitcase filled with Savage's money. She convinced Steve McMichael to turn heel, a turn actually teased twice during the match in the commentary as they made clear that after a career with the Bears, McMichael played his final season with Green Bay and said he did it because they offered him more money. He hit Green over the head with a suitcase and put Flair on top for the pin, then opened the suitcase and put on a Four Horsemen t-shirt to become the fourth member of the group. Given Kevin Sullivan the credit for basically laying out the particulars of this angle, McMichael has tremendous heel presence and charisma, and as long as they keep him in tags with Anderson and Benoit, he won't have to do that much in the ring to get by. Three and one half stars. Then came those two large dreaded nameless heels known as we know who they are. The men with no name came out to a big babyface pop. Then, as a way to avert a threatened lawsuit, both men said clearly that they don't work for the World Wrestling Federation and said to forget about the past and talk about the future. After Bischoff accepted the challenge and announced the match for Bash at the beach, Scott Hall punched Bischoff in the stomach and Kevin Nash power bombed him through a table. This got a babyface pop among some fans, but left others pretty much stunned. It was sold great as Schiavone left the broadcast position and Rhodes did a strong unity of the promotion interview. The fans still mainly cheered Hall and Nash when they left. 9. The Giant Paul White pinned Lex Luger, Larry Fall to retain the WCW heavyweight title in 921. They had no chance following what had gone on. Sting ended up chasing Jimmy Hart away from the ring. It was a dead match with the only thing of note with Giant on the top rope. Luger bent down a little and got him on his shoulders for the rack. He then collapsed under the weight and Giant pinned him with a choke slam. One and one quarter stars. The next pay-per-view on July 7th from Daytona Beach, Florida will consist of the unnamed guys versus Sting and Luger and Savage, Conan defending the US title against Flair, Giant and Sullivan versus Benoit and Anderson and if Benoit and Anderson win, Flair gets a shot at Giant. Nasty Boys vs. Public Enemy in a double dog collar match. They are hoping to get Dennis Rodman to be in Nasty's corner for this match but that is far from a done deal. Mysterio Jr. vs. Psychosis. Bubba vs. Tenda in what is billed as a Carson City Silver Dollar match and McMichael vs. Joe Gomez. If the bash took its lumps at the hands of the NBA, the Pancrase Brawl at Budokan pay-per-view on June 14th, taped May 16th at Tokyo's Budokan Hall, likely took even more of a hit. WCW at least had a lot of hype and tons of television exposure going for it plus a hardcore base of fans. Pancrase's audience is a group of people who saw the first show, probably mainly UFC fans looking at something new, and maybe some additional curiosity seekers and some fringe sports fans. A mainstream event like the NBA playoffs is competition they likely don't have the hardcore base to handle. In addition, because WCW would have drawn a much larger audience, the traditional Tuesday night replay of weekend pay-per-view events went to WCW, leaving Pancrase without a midweek replay showing. Semaphore Entertainment Group has taken its lumps when it comes to scheduling since going head-up with the Tyson fight in December. Its July 12th UFC pay-per-view comes one day before another Tyson fight, 
problems that all crop up well after Semaphore Entertainment Group has locked in its pay-per-view schedule for the year. While some may not think going a day ahead of Tyson will hurt, there is a boxing UFC crossover and a Tyson fight is the most powerful event of any kind on pay-per-view. More importantly, without its own television show, UFC is sold largely on Barker Channel commercials. The Barker Channels will be devoting the bulk of its commercial time pushing the more lucrative Tyson fight, leaving UFC with far less of a push. The show was a similar format to the previous Pancrase pay-per-view show, with a better quality of matches. Once again, the show received an overwhelmingly positive poll response. It was an easy thumbs-up show, and comparing it with WCW is like comparing apples and oranges and unfair, but I'd rate the WCW show as being much better even though the poll results between the two were similar. Bruce Beck replaced Don Wilson on commentary, working with Ken Shamrock. Beck started out as a novice, but appeared to be a quick study and by midway through the show he was rolling and did a great job by the time the main event rolled around. The argument that Beck shouldn't be considered as one of the best wrestling announcers because he does UFC had merit last year, since UFC isn't pro wrestling. But that argument is now out the window because he does Pancrase, which is pro wrestling, and there are only one or two pro wrestling announcers in the US that can do a call at the level he did for the main event. Shamrock was good on color to a point and again received overwhelmingly high praise. He was more comfortable than the first time out. He still did a good job of explaining strategy to the novice fan, he wasn't as good in getting the various personalities over as divergent individuals. He had less to work with in his explaining the holds because less submissions were used on this show. And he did miss many key points during the show. In every Pancras event, the argument over legitimacy will come up. Because this event is pro-wrestling and derived from pro-wrestling, one should have natural skepticism. Its supporters believe in it passionately. All the martial arts magazines and newsletters I've seen have never even questioned its authenticity, which may or may not be a statement regarding the genre more than evidence of legitimacy. No doubt there have been worked matches in the past in Pancrase and work spots, as well as non-worked matches. The injury rate from the submission holds is far too high for a totally worked event because in a worked event you wouldn't rip the joint applying a submission, and the fact is, joints have been ripped out to the point the dangerous heel hooks had to be banned for preservation of the species reasons. The booking makes absolutely no sense if it is worked on many different levels, although we've seen that in traditional pro wrestling as well. If it was booked for maximum box office, then Funaki and Suzuki, who are the drawing cards, wouldn't lose so often and would be in the title picture when it came to the biggest show of the year, which this card was. But there are things that go on that don't look to make sense in a realistic fighting situation. Then again, there are fighters who have done absolutely stupid things in UFC and boxing and amateur wrestling matches that clearly aren't worked. Someone occasionally going down from blows that don't look that devastating happens often in boxing. But it seems to happen in Pancrase a little more often. Boss Rutten and Frank Shamrock had what was either a tremendous work shoot, in that the kicks and punches were very stiff and it looked tremendously realistic for a worked match, far more than you would ever see in any other shoot-style wrestling promotion. Or they had a shoot in which Frank Shamrock did a number of things that make no sense. There was a sense that the match seemed to build to a finish looking at it from the finish backwards, the finish in this case was the doctor stopping the match because of a dangerous cut near Shamrock's eye. The argument it was a planned finish gained some strength because there wasn't that much blood coming from the cut at the time the match was stopped. Although when Shamrock was at UFC the next day, his eye looked pretty bad. I could make the same argument about a finish that seemed to build throughout the match about Chavez de la Hoya, and I have no doubts that finish was a shoot. Just before the finish, Shamrock was on the mat facing Rutten and just sat there and took blow after blow aimed to the already cut eye and even made Hulk Hogan-like faces daring him to throw another blow. Of course we know there is showboating in Pancrase, and it isn't like good boxers don't taunt their opponents in the same exact way for psychological or crowd-pleasing reasons. Eventually Rutan's legal palm blows turned into illegal punches to the eye, which earned him a red card and a lost point. Did Rutan start throwing punches? Clearly against the rules in a sport where rules are pretty strictly enforced and adhered to, because he was frustrated, or did he do it because the finish was supposed to be a stoppage on blood, and quite frankly, the palm blows weren't doing an effective enough job of opening up the cut? In addition, not only did Shamrock, already with a cut in a dangerous spot that had been looked at once by the doctor, appear to be doing nothing to avoid the blows, but was actually leaning his head forward into the blows, clearly shown on replay. On the other hand, the backhand blow to the eye that Rutten opened the original cut with, because of how fast both were moving and how it was administered on a turnaround follow-through, could not have been a planned high spot, 
at least to the point it would be expected to cut the eye because two guys moving that fast on a backhand follow-through simply couldn't hit a target with that kind of accuracy. For the two to go into the fight with the idea that we're building to a stopped on blood ending, while the closing sequence would back up the argument. The sequence of the original cut nearly destroys the argument. The only response can be that they were building to a stopped on blood finish and by sheer coincidence, Rudin managed to open a cut with an unplanned spot in the exact same spot he was supposed to open the cut with later. Of course that is possible, but truthfully what are the odds of that happening? My basic conclusion is that if it was a work, it was a tremendously stiff, believable worked match. If it was a shoot, it was very exciting to watch but Shamrock's strategy, or lack thereof, turned out to be playing right into Rudin's hands. As for the other matches, Daimezger vs Minoru Suzuki was where Ken Shamrock missed an important point in commentary. Both had agreed this would be a theme standing up match, which played Demesder's strengths as a kickboxer and eliminated all ground wrestling, so he would have been the favorite. Shamrock announced it as if it were under traditional rules without the agreement, and thus told a story of Suzuki's inability to take Mesder down. In fact Suzuki inexplicably unless you knew it was a theme match, never even tried, and thus was beaten in a rather one-sided fight. Because of the rules, the match consisted almost entirely of palm blows, kicks and knees and Suzuki took a pummeling before the finish. But there were some questionable looking things there as well in particular a post-match where Suzuki, after being knocked out, got up groggy shook Mezger's hand, and then collapsed again, a scene very reminiscent of all Japan women post-match spots. Masakatsu Funaki vs. August Smile was short and a lot of fun to watch because of Funaki's body speed and avoiding the much larger, stronger and slower Smile. Smile was a Bill Kazmaier-sized monster, with a strong background in both Greco-Roman wrestling and World's Strongest Man contests, and currently is a pro wrestler for Otto Wands in Austria. With Smile having every bit of 5 inches in height and 88 pounds on Funaki, Funaki came out looking great as he knocked Smile down with a kick, which supposedly knocked Smile silly since those at the show reported that he couldn't remember much about the match afterwards. Funaki managed to get behind him and apply a strong choke in 201. From a pure wrestling standpoint, the best match was Jason Delusia vs. Asami Shibuya. The match was almost totally on the mat with both moving quickly and constantly looking for submissions. Delusia dominated and won by a 3-0 margin with three different chokes applied with Shibuya able to get to the ropes each time, before the 15-minute time limit expired. The second match was less exciting. Semishield of Holland vs. Manabu Yamada. Schult was billed at 6 foot 8, 227 pounds and if anything, he looked much taller than that although that may partially be because Yamada is so short. Because he had that gangly long-limbed high school center type of build, his movements didn't look good because his legs were so long, although his knees to the face that looked weak at first, looked far more powerful in slow motion. Shamrock failed to mention, probably because he simply didn't know that Yamada had broken a rib in this match. When Schilt did a weakly applied choke sleeper, Yamada tapped at 544 because it was twisting him in a manner that was making the rib pain unbearable, not because the choke was well applied. The opener was decent but uneventful. Ishiki Takahashi pretty well dominated the much smaller Takafumi Ito for their 10-minute match using his superior strength and balance, however neither delivered any telling blows or came close with any submissions. With no points during the match, it went to the judges who awarded Takahashi the decision. The next pay-per-view will be August 18th entitled Kings of Pancrase, showing some of the best matches in the three-year history of the promotion focusing on Ken Shamrock, Frank Shamrock, Rutan, and Suzuki. Black Tiger Eddie Guerrero captured New Japan's annual Best of the Super Junior Tournament on June 12th in Osaka, and followed it up with a second main event performance losing to IWGP champ Great Sasuke on the June 17th Skydiving J Show at Tokyo Budokan Hall. The tournament, which came off as something of a letdown this year due to numerous injuries, picked up in the final two days with what we've heard were excellent semifinals and championship match. The semifinals on June 11th in Hiroshima before a sellout 5,200 saw Tiger pin Wild Pegasus in 2017 and Jushin Liger pinned El Samurai in 1511 with La Magistral. The championship match the next night before a sellout 6,650 in Osaka saw Tiger pin Liger for the second time on the tour, using a brainbuster to set up the finish. It was Tiger's biggest career win in Japan, and probably anywhere else for that matter. Previous tournament winners were Norio Onaga in 1991. Jushin Liger in 1992, Pegasus in 1993, Liger in 1994 and Pegasus in 1995. The win made sense on several levels, and it gave credibility to Tiger in the scheduled IWGP Junior title match on June 17, 
and in future title matches as well, and also heats up a long-term program with Liger. Results from the June 17th Budokan show before a crowd estimated at 13,500 saw. 1. Lance Storm and Yuji Yasu Ryoka, WAR, retained their War International Junior Tag Team titles beating El Samurai and Norio Onaga New Japan in 1328 when Storm pinned Onaga in a good opener. 2. Masayoshi Motegi, Wrestle Dream Factory, pinned Shiryu Michinoku Pro, to retain the NWA Junior Heavyweight title in 1151. This was reported as a poor match because Motegi looked bad. 3. Gran Hamada, Michinoku, retained his WWA, Mexico, Junior Light Heavyweight title pinning Tatsuhito Takaiwa, New Japan, in 12.05 with a swinging DDT off the top rope. This match had great heat because the fans were really into the storyline of the young Takaiwa getting near fall after near fall and nearly scoring the upset. 4. Shinjiro Otani became the new UWA Mexico World Light Heavyweight Champion beating Kazushi Sakuraba of UWFI in 8.13. Koji Kanemoto was the champion but he broke his collarbone last month and is out of action. Hinichi Yamamoto of the Golden Cups was the scheduled challenger but he also missed the match due to injury. This was a UWFI style match but Otani is such a great worker that he can have a great match doing any style. Otani made it look as though prelim wrestler Sakuraba had him checkmated with the chokesleeper at 5 minutes, before Otani came back with all his big spots and used a chicken wing cross face with a submission victory. 5. Super Delphin Michinoku, retained his CMLL welterweight title pinning Taka Michinoku, Michinoku slash FMW Independent Junior Champion, in 1609 with a Tiger Suplex. These two had a long history of being tag partners and this was a great flying match, said to be the second best match on the show. 6. Ultimo Dragon, WAR, retained his international junior title pinning Grand Naniwa with La Magistral Danana, in 1358 in a good match. 7. Liger won the Great Britain junior heavyweight title pinning Dick Togo, Michinoku, in 1556. This was the only title change on the show. 8. Sasuke kept the IWGP junior heavyweight title pinning Tiger in 1654 with a die-hard, Splash Mountain off the top rope, turned into a Frankensteiner finish, the same finish Mysterio Jr. has been doing this year in many of his big matches including the Philadelphia 2 out of 3 fall bout with Juventud Guerrera. This was said to be the best match of the show. After the match, all the wrestlers on the show got into the ring and Liger got on the house mic and said that they need to determine of all the champions, who the real number one junior heavyweight in the world is. Earlier, when Liger was doing the color commentary for the TV show during the main event, Liger brought it up again and talked about wanting it during the G1 Climax Tour from August 2nd to August 6th at Sumo Hall, so apparently Liger is going to book a junior tournament of champions with Motegi, Hamada Otani, Delphin, Dragon, Sasuke, Tiger and himself for that week. We don't have complete results from the June 14th Triple Mania 4B in Orisaba before an estimated 7,000 fans, half house, at the bullring in that city. The show itself was described as an awesome show. The main event was a lumberjack strap match where the new Mascara Sagrada, Cranio, who didn't look good at all, and Octagon and La Parca beat CN Cars and Killer and Heavy Metal in a match with Rey Mysterio Jr., Super Colo, Conan, Winners, Kosas, Juventud Guerrera, Halloween and Pierrot Jr. all interfering freely as lumberjacks. Lady Victoria, who has been doing the babyface ballet role on Conan's shows in Baja, California, made her debut on a major AAA show doing a run-in attacking Killer's manager Janet and hit her with a chair, which I'm told got the biggest pop of the entire show. The other major event on the show was a tournament of champions with Pantera, Guerrera, Viano 3, Pimpinela Escarlata, Conan, Pero Agueo, Sicosis, and Pierrot Jr., all of whom hold some singles title belt in Mexico. It came down to Conan and Pierrot with Pierrot scoring a clean pin using a low blow and three power bombs. The match was said to be a combination of Japanese, Mexican and starting to incorporate American styles in as well. The reports we got were that in a prelim match, El Mosco, who is 18 and has less than one year experience and trained with Pero Agueo Jr. in Guadalajara, looked awesome and is about to earn himself a good spot. Halloween did a space flying tiger drop, and Pimpinela, doing the transvestite gimmick, stole the show with his aggressive work and hill charisma. In typical AAA fashion, even though it could be only two weeks away, we're not even sure of when or where the final Triple Mania will be. The magazines are now listing the show of July 13th at El Toreo in Naucalpan, although others are listing the same location but the date at either June 29th or June 30th with the wrestlers still under the impression that it is June 29th. Antonio Pena has told some people it'll be in Naucalpan, 
but is still telling others it'll be in Guadalajara. According to the magazines the lineup will be the four masks versus four masks with Los Payasos and Cars La Momia versus Los Atomic Juniors, Alcón Dorado Jr. and Teen Yablas Jr. and Mascara Sagrada Jr. and Blue Demon Jr., a car versus car match with the WWA welterweight title at stake with Guerrera defending against Mysterio Jr. Since Guerrera is scheduled to be defending the title in Japan in late July, that seems to indicate he's winning the car match, an incredible partners match with Ogueo and Octagon and Pieroth versus Parca and Cien Caras and Cibernetico, a lumberjack strap match with Sagrada and Pantera and Ultimo Dragon versus Los Villanos, Los Destructors versus El Mexicano and Torero and Salsero and the opener will be Minis with Mini Yeti and Espectritos 1 and 2 versus Super Muñequito and Torito and Mascara de Sagrada Jr., formerly Baby Rabbit. The weekly USWA wrestling tradition in Memphis has officially left the Mid-South Coliseum with the final show billed as the last blast at the Coliseum, having taken place on June 17th. We don't have a report on the show at press time. The first match at the new Expo building at the Memphis Flea Market will be on July 1st. In an article in the Memphis Commercial Appeal, co-promoter Jerry Lawler complained crowds had dropped at the Coliseum because of increased security measures such as fans going through metal detectors and being frisked entering the building and wrestling with all the building lights turned on to ruin the atmosphere, along with the matches being held with leftover ice from the hockey games round. Coliseum manager Beth Wade, who Lawler has gone round and round with for years on various problems, said they wanted the lights kept bright so the ushers could keep everyone in their seats, and said the security precautions were necessary because families were coming to the shows and complaining that they didn't feel safe. Pro wrestling started its run at the 11,000-seat Coliseum in 1971. During its best one-year period, when Lawler was one of the city's biggest celebrities, Jarrett Promotions, it wasn't called USWA in those days, drew an excess of 350,000 fans for weekly events. It has run almost weekly there for most of the past 25 years, with the exception of a brief period where Lawler and Wade had a falling out and they left the Coliseum, but came back a few months later. Over the years there have been other televised threats to move when the Coliseum attempted to raise the rent or charge for parking which Jarrett and Lawler felt would hurt the crowds. Crowds had bottomed out this year, sometimes falling as low as $2,000 houses, 250 fans, in the past two months. The June 10th show was up to 700 fans and $5,500 but that was after being away for three weeks. Part of the crowd decline has to be attributed to Monday Nitro, giving fans two free hours with major league stars on television head-to-head -head with the Coliseum House shows with local wrestlers. Nitro has also forced WWF to upgrade the match quality on Raw, making it more compelling. USWA didn't really do anything major as far as bringing in former area stars for the final event. The biggest angle to draw involved longtime announcer Lance Russell, doing one of his rare career angles, in the corner opposite longtime friend Lawler. The angle on television was that Lawler had signed Scott Bowden to a deal as his manager on a trial basis, which probably means they were looking for a foil for Russell for an angle, and Bowden and Russell got into it during the entire television show ending up with Russell saying he would be in Cyberpunk Fire's corner in his match against Lawler, with Bowden in his corner, and would bring one of his golf clubs with him if Bowden got out of line. The other key matches on the show are Jeff Jarrett vs. Brian Christopher for the unified title and a one-night tag tourney for the vacant USWA tag titles, Bill Dundee lost the Loser Leaves Town match on June 8th, he and Lawler were the champs, with Tommy Rich and Doug Gilbert, Brickhouse Brown and Reggie B. Fine, Bart Sawyer, and Flex Cabana, Punisher and Tony Falk in men. Results June 7th, Mexico City Arena, Mexico, EMLL, Ciclanchito Ramirez and Mascarita Magica B. Fierito and Guerrero del Futuro, Guerrero Maya and Guerrero del Futuro and Damian El Guerrero D. Ultimatum and Filoso and Alacron, Star and Youngsters Combined Tag Tournament, Bestia Salvaje and Chicago Express B. Dos Caras and Bronco, El Ijo del Santo and Olimpico B. Felino and Astro Ray Jr., Rambo and Guerrero de la Muerte B. El Brasso and Olympus, Atlantis and Atlantico B. Apollo Dantes and Ray Bucanero, Salvaje and Express B. Santo and Olimpico, Atlantis and Atlantico B. Rambo and Muerte DQ Express and Salvaje B. Atlantis and Atlantico to win tourney, Dandied Per Negro Casas. June 8th, Moline, Illinois, WWF, 3186, Justin Bradshaw B. Barry Horowitz, one half of one star, New Rockers B. Duke Dries and Aldo Montoya, two stars. Savio Vega B. Owen Hart Dud, Mark Marrow B. Hunter Hurst Helmsley 1 star, Ahmed Johnson B. Davy Boy Smith DQ negative 2 stars, Ultimate Warrior B. Vader Dud WWF Tag Titles, Godwins B. Smoking Guns Core negative 4 stars, 
Jake Roberts B. Steve Austin Dud, Undertaker B. Mankind Dud, WWF Tile, Shawn Michaels B. Goldust Two and a Half Stars. June 8th, Youngstown, Ohio, WCW, 2620, Diamond Dallas Page B. Alex Wright, U.S. Title, Conan B. Big Bubba, VK Wall Street B. Joe Gomez, Street Fight, Nasty Boys B. Public Enemy, Randy Savage B. Ric Flair, WCW Title, The Giant B. Sting DQ. June 9th, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, WCW, 1844, Diamond Dallas Page B. Alex Wright, U.S. Title, Conan B. Big Bubba, VK Wall Street B. Joe Gomez, Street Fight, Nasty Boys B. Public Enemy, Randy Savage B. Ric Flair, WCW Title, The Giant B. Sting DQ. June 9th, Pachuca, Triple A, Grand Apaches 1 and 2 B. Quarterback and El Mosco, Spectro and Picudo and Perro Silva B. Salcero and Winners and Super Colo, Alcone Dorado Jr. and Blue Demon Jr. and Team Yablas Jr. and Mascara Sagrada Jr. B. Los Piasos and Caras La Momia, Octagon and Hong Kong Lee, Cato Kung Lee, B. Jerry Estrada and Heavy Metal DQ. June 10th, Memphis, USWA, 700, Flex Cabana B. Tony Falk, Sir Moby Bart Sawyer, Miss Texas B. Farron Square, Doug Gilbert B. King Mabel DQ, USWA title, Brian Christopher B. The Punisher, Mask vs. $5,000, Cyberpunk Fire B. Jerry Lawler DQ, Unified title, Loser Leaves Town Match, Jeff Jarrett B. Jesse James Armstrong, Gilbert won Battle Royal. June 10th, Nigata IWA, 130, Takeshi Sato and Katsumi Hirano B. Tutor the Turtle and Jun Nago Ka, Emi Motokawa B. Kadoka, Orito B. Feli Nito, Hiroshi Itakura and Keisuke Yamada B. Akinori Sukioka and Flying Kitty Ichihara, Takashi Okano B. Keizo Matsuda, Steel Leather and Leatherface B. Silver Jason and Vampiro Casanova, NWA and IWA Tag Titles, Tarzan Goto and Mr. Ganasuke B. Black Hearts. June 10th Imabari WAR, Yuji Asurioka B. Jun Kikuchi, Kakashi Okamura B. Battle Ranger, Ultimo Dragon B. Damian, Arashi B. Masaaki Mochizuki, Koki Kitahara and Osamu Teitoko B. Lion Du, Lion Heart and T. Du, Big Titan Geno and Jado and Hiramichi Fuyuki B. Genichiro Tenryu and Nobutaka Araya, and Nobukazu Hirai. June 11th Hiroshima, New Japan, 5,200 sellout, Tatsuhito Takaiwa and Shinjiro Otani B. Yuji Nagata and Tokumitsu Ishizawa Franz Schumann and Dean Malenko B. Black Cat and Norio Onaga, Kengo Kimura and Akitoshi Saito and Mishiyoshi Ohara B. Tadao Yasuda and Osamu Nishimura and Junji Hirata, Keiji Muto B. Tatsutoshi Goto, Takashi Izuka and Kazuo Yamazaki B. Osamu Kido and Kensuke Sasaki, Akira Nagami and Shiro Koshinaka and Tatsumi Fujinami B. Hiro Saito and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Masa Chono, top of Super Junior Semifinals, Black Tiger B. Wild Pegasus 2017, Jushin Liger B. L. Samurai 1511, IWGP HWT title, Shinya Hashimoto B. Satoshi Kojima. June 11th Ahime, WAR, Nobukazu Hirai B. Jun Kikuchi, Yuji Yasuriyoka B. Damian, Ultimo Dragon B. Battle Ranger, Osamu Teitoko B. Takashi Okamura, Big Titan and Lion Heart and Jado B. Masa Akimochizuki and Nobutaka Araya and Arashi. Genichiro Tenryu and Koki Kitahara B. Hiramichi Fuyuki and Ghetto. June 11th Tokyo Karaku and Hall, Wrestle Dream Factory, 200 UWA Welter Title, Super Crazy B. Onryo, Yoshiaki Fujiwara B. Hiroyoshi Katsubo, NWA Junior Title, Masayoshi Motegi B. Hector Garza. June 12th Osaka Furitsu Gym, New Japan, 6,650 sellout Tokumitsu Ishizawa and Yuji Nagana B. Akitoshi Saito and Mishiyoshi Ohara 1027. Franz Schumann and Dean Malenko B. Black Cat and Biano 4907, Akira Nagami and Tatsutoshi Goto and Kengo Kimura B. Yutaka Yoshi and Tadao Yasuda and Osamu Kido 1109, Wild Pegasus and El Samurai B. Tatsuhito Takaiwa and Shinjiro Otani 1257, Osamu Nishimura and Keiji Muto B. Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Masa Chono 1109, Tatsumi Fujinami and Shiro Koshinaka B. Kensuke Sasaki and Satoshi Kojima 1029, IWGP Tag Titles. Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izukabi Shinya Hashimoto and Junji Hirata to win belts 1626, top of the Super Junior Tournament Final, Black Tiger B. Jushin Liger 1844. June 12th Anderson, South Carolina, WCW Saturday Night Tapings, 1200, Marcus Bagwell B. DK Wall Street, Jim Duggan B. Gambler, Rick and Scott Steiner B. Harlem Heat, Scott Norton and Ice Train B. High Voltage, Diamond Dallas Page B. Scotty Riggs, Arnold Anderson B. Brad Armstrong. Steve Regal B. Johnny Wild, Giant B. Cobra and Prince Aokia and Mark Starr and Unknown, John Tenna B. Top Gun, David Cannell slash Sierra, Lex Luger B. Barbarian. 
June 12, Tokyo Karaku in Hall, Wings, 2030 sellout, Bunkhouse match, Wing Kanemura B. Haido, Riki Fuji and Yuki Ishikawa B. Gasaku Goshigawara and Nanjo Hayato, Kanemura B. Toryu, Bunkhouse match, Mr. Pogo B. Hideki Hasaka, Street Fight, Tetsuhiro Kuroda and Koji Nakagawa and Masato Tanaka B. Kanemura and Haido and Hasaka. June 13, Yuga, WAR, Yuji Yasu Ryoka and Masaaki Mochizuki B. June Kikuchi and Osamu Teitoko, Nobutaka Araya B. Damian. Ultimo Dragon B. Battle Ranger, Big Titan B. Nobukazu Hirai, Koki Kitahara B. Takashi Okamura, Denichiro Tenryu and Arashi B. Ghetto and Jado. June 14, Denver, WWF, 2203, New Rockers B. Bushwhackers, Justin Bradshaw B. Barry Horowitz, Savio Vega B. Owen Hart, Mark Merrow B. Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Steve Austin B. Duke Dries, Ultimate Warrior Curvator, WWF Tag Titles, Godwins B. Smoking Guns Corps, Ahmed Johnson B. Davy Boy Smith DQ, Undertaker B. Mankind, WWF Title, Shawn Michaels B. Gold Dust. June 14, Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, ECW, Bad Crew B. Devon Dudley and Bubba Ray Dudley DQ Dud. J.T. Smith and Little Guido B. Devon Storm and Sal Baloma One Star, Paul Verlins B. Jason Helton Dud, Mikey Whipwreck B. Stevie Richards Two and a Half Stars, ECW Tag Titles, Eliminators B. Gangsters Two and a Half Stars, Bruce Brothers B. Hack Myers and Axel Rotten One Star, Taz B. Sandman Dud, ECW TV Title, Pit Bull Number Two B. Shane Douglas One One Half Star, ECW Title, Raven B. Tommy Dreamer Three Stars. June 14, Mexico City Arena, Mexico, EMLL, Damien Cito and Ultrate Mbita B. Ciclan Cheeto Ramirez and Ultimo Dragon Cheeto, Atlantico and Olympico and Ultraman Jr. B. Moger and Chicago Express and Alcone Negro Jr., Black Warrior, Black Panther, and Scorpio Jr. and Guerrero de la Muerte B. Ringo Mendoza and Mr. Niebla and Bronco, La Fiera and Solar and Vampiro Canadiense B. Ray Bucanero and Violencia and Archangel, Mascara Sagrada and Dandy and Dos Caras B. Dr. Wagner Jr. and Apollo Dantes and Bestia Salvaje. June 14, West Detford, New Jersey, NWA, Blue Thunder B. Glenn Osborne, NWA title, Dan Severn B. Ghetto Blaster. Lost Boys DDQ Greek Connection, Ian Rotten B. Madman Pondo, Jimmy Snuka B. Metal Maniac, Skip B. Inferno Kid, Icon B. Dave Dutch. Twiggy Ramirez B. Gino Caruso, Tommy Cairo B. Derek Domino, Johnny Gunn and Ace Darling B. Brian Christopher and Doug Gilbert. June 14, Hachinahe, Tokyo Pro Wrestling, Orito B. Filainito, Billy Black B. Masanobu Kurisu, Cage Boshi and Shocker B. Akihiko Masuda and Shige Okamura, Great Kabuki B. Kishin Kawabata, Gekko B. Astro Ray Jr., Watsuma, Too Cold Scorpio, and Takashi Ishikawa B. Daiko Kubo Benkei and Abdullah the Butcher. June 14, Reading, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling, Double Delight B. Assassins, DZ Gillespie B. Pat Shamrock, Fantasia B. Nasty Angel, Cheetah Master B. Shane Shadows, Max Crimson B. Super Ninja Boogie Woogie Brown NC Cremator, Mark Mest B. Race Richards, Lance Diamond D. Cheetah Master, Brown and Delight B. Gillespie and Assassins, Ray Odyssey B. Isaac Yonkem. June 15, Hakata War, 2600, Takashi Okamura B. Battle Ranger, Yuji Yasuriyoka B. Damian, Nobutaka Araya, and Nobukazu Hirai B. Jun Kikuchi and Arashi, Koki Kitahara B. Masaaki Mochizuki, Ultimo Dragon and Genichiro Tenryu B. Lion Du and T. Du, War 6 Man Titles, Geto and Jado and Hiramichi Fuyuki B. Yoji Anjo and Yoshihiro Takayama and 200% Machine. June 15 Omiya, All Japan Women, 2140, Ri Tamada B. Genki Misae, Japanese Junior Title. Yoshiko Tamura Diyumi Fukawa 20 minutes, Tomoko Watanabe B. Kumiko Makawa, Chiquita Azteca, Esther Moreno, and Yumiko Hatabi Saya Endo and Asia Kong, Tashio Yamada and Atsuko Mitabi Kyoko Inoue and Takako Inoue, Marco Yoshida and Kaoru Ito B. Manami Toyota and Mima Shimoda. June 15, Las Vegas, NWC, Luis B. Coley B. Lil Haystacks, Wayne Bradley, Larry Powers B. Tamatoa, Don Juan B. Navajo Kid, Sean Dakota, Rob Van Dam and Bobby Bradley Jr. B. Superboy and Principe Endu, Iron Sheik, DDQ Johnny Payne, Sabu One Triangular Cage Match Over Kama and Virgil. June 15, Philadelphia, NWA, 200, Chaotic Kid Kane B. Irwin Soul, Brian Christopher B. Ace Darling, Doug Gilbert B. Icon, Twiggy Ramirez B. Lost Boy, Dan Wolf, Bad Attitude NC Jack Ryder and Citron, NWA Title, Dan Severn B. Ghetto Blaster, Derek Domino B. Abuda Singh.
Wu Bradley slash John Rickner, Na Title, Tommy Cairo B. Battlestar, Rick Ratchet B. Thomas Rodman, Barbed Wire Thumbtacks Broken Glass Mouse Trap Match, Ian Rotten B. Mad Man Pondo. June 15, Forks Township, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling, Cheetah Master and Jimmy B. Good B. Lance Diamond and Shane Shadows, DZ Gillespie B. Pat Shamrock, Nasty Angel B. Fantasia, Double Delight B. Assassins, Aldo Montoya B. Skip, Race Richards and Shamrock B. Max Crimson and Cremator, Boogie Woogie Brown B. Diablo Macabra, Mark Mest B. Super Ninja, Julio Sanchez B. Troy Mest, Isaac Yonkem B. Ray Odyssey Core. June 15, Knoxville, Tennessee, Tennessee Mountain Wrestling, 250, The Olympian B. Killer Kyle, Candy Divine B. Regina Hale, Chris Powers and Mongolian Stomper B. Ricky Morton and Tracy Smothers, 8 Ball Jones B. Bunkhouse Buck DQ, Cage Match, Dirty White Boy NC Chip the Firebreaker. June 16, Tokyo Karakuen Hall, JWP, 2200 Sellout, Candy Akutsu and Hikari Fukuoka B. Saburo and Fuseo Nauchi, Tag Tourney Semis, Ryoko Amano and Mayumi Ozaki B. Cutie Suzuki and Tomoko Kuzumi, Tanako Matoya and Dynamite Kansai B. Devil Masami and Tomoko Miguchi, Asia Kong B. Hiromi Yagi, Tourney Finals, Matoya and Kansai B. Amano and Ozaki. June 16, Tokyo Karaku and Hall, Chia, 2200 Sellout, Chihiro Nakano B. Ishid, Nakano B. Yamamoto, Mimashimoto and Toshie Uematsu B. Kaoru and Sonoko Kato. Yasha Kuranai and Mikiko Futagami and Karula B. Bomber Hikari and Chikeo Nagashima and Toshie Sato B. Miki Numao and Chigusa Nagio B. Mako Satomura and Tashio Yamada. June 16, Yomiuri Land, All Japan Women, Ri Tamada B. Yumi Fukawa, Asia Kong B. Genki Misae and Yoshiko Tamura, Takako Inoue and Sai Endo B. Tomoko Watanabe and Kumiko Makawa at Suko Mita B. Mariko Yoshida, Kyoko Inoue and Yumiko Hotabi Kaoru Ito and Manami Toyota. June 16, Kawasaki, Yoshimoto Pro Wrestling, 750, Chikako Shiratori B. Kasugi, A. B. Amano, Koyama B. Fujimura, Shiratori and Jaguar Yokota B. Kuga and Bloody Phoenix, Bison Kimura and Nephili B. Linus Asuka and Esther Moreno. June 16, Hakodate, Tokyo Pro Wrestling, Orito B. Filaneo, Masanobu Kurisu B. Akigo Masuda, Astro Ray Jr. and Shocker B. Gekko and Cage Boshi, Watsuma B. Billy Black, Great Kabuki B. Shigeo Okamura, Daiko Kubo Benkei and Abdullah the Butcher B. Takashi Ishikawa and Kishin Kawabata. June 16, Tashikawa Michinoku Pro, 274, Dick Togo B. Sugimoto, Billy Blaze N.C. Wellington Wilkins Jr., Men's Teo and Shiryu B. Masato Yakashiji and Mascara Magica, Super Delphin B. Naohiro Hoshikawa, Great Sasuke and Grand Hamada and Tiger Mask B. Shoichi Funaki and Grand Naniwa and Taka Michinoku. June 17, Richmond, Virginia, WCW Monday Nitro Tapings, 5,638, Conan B. Jim Powers, Rick Steiner B. Stevie Ray, Joe Gomez B. Disco Inferno, Arnold Anderson and Chris Benoit B. American Males, John Tenna B. Big Bubba, Rick Flair B. Randy Savage, WCW Cruiserweight Title, Dean Malenko B. Ray Mysterio Jr., WCW Title, Giant B. Scott Steiner. Special thanks to Gold Coles Root, Jason Freeman, Dan Garza, Scott Hudson, Greg John, Peggy Watkins, Bob Verhey, Chuck Longerman, Brian Hildebrand, Coach Kurt Schneider, Steve Dr. Lucha Sims, James Titus, Dan Paris, Leonard Brand, Bill Needham, Ken Doucet, Dan Moreland, Jesse Money, Walt Spafford. EMLL. The biggest news in Mexico is that Wolf Rubinsky, one of the all-time wrestling legends, suffered a heart attack while walking in Mexico City on June 12 and had a bad fall. He was in very serious condition for two days. Rubinsky had a bad fall on June 12 on a city street in Mexico. He was the first wrestler in Mexico to become a movie star, preceding El Santo who became the biggest star of them all. Rubinsky is the head of the wrestling commission in the Distrito Federal, although these days Ray Mendoza and Huracan Ramirez are the real power forces. The return to Arena Mexico on June 14 didn't draw flies and our reports are the card was really bad as well. The main event saw the original Mascara Sagrada return to Arena Mexico to team with Dandy and Dos Caras to beat Dr. Wagner Jr. and Apollo Dantes and Bestia Salvaje when Sagrada made Wagner submit in the third fall to set up a match for Wagner's CMLL light heavyweight title which will likely be this week's main event. Black Panther has changed his name to Black Warrior. Sagrada was interviewed both for television and newspapers after the main event and claimed he was the only and real Mascara Sagrada and was really mad about all the new Sagrada characters that Antonio Pena has created.
I'm not sure if this was an in-your-face deal or I'm reading too much into this, but Sagrada was accompanied to the ring by Vicky Palacios, a local beauty queen that was at least at one point the girlfriend of Conan. Triple A. Heavy metal has been suspended for one year from Baja, California, for failing a drug test. He tested positive for cocaine, marijuana, amphetamines and methamphetamines. There is a great deal of bitterness coming out of the Peace Festival show. At this point Pena won't be involved in future shows because of the promotional war with EMLL. He was mad that Antonio Inoki flew to Mexico and thanked Paco Alonso, who didn't even attend the show, for being involved, and never thanked Pena. Inoki and Alonso met about doing a show in Mexico City next year and Alonso was made head promoter of the show and Pena, his assistant which Pena wasn't thrilled with, and he was also mad that New Japan is supposed to be working with AAA, but booked EMLL wrestler Emilio Charles Jr. on the junior tournament. Box E. Lucha, the so-called Bible of Mexican wrestling reported that the Peace Festival was a flop but did say that Mexican matches stole the show. All Japan. The theme of the next tour seems to be heavy pushes for Brian Diet, Monokia Mossman, Ryu Kaku Izamida and especially Jun Akiyama. In addition, Gary Albright and Toshiaki Kawada tag team regularly on this tour, however Kawada and Akira Tao are still getting a title shot at Akiyama and Mitsuharu Misawa on July 9th in Kanazawa. The top three matches for July 24th at Budokan Hall are Tao vs. Kena Kobashi for the Triple Crown, Misawa and Akiyama vs. Albright and Kauta and Steve Williams and Johnny Ace vs. Stan Hansen and Mossman. The other Tokyo dates for the tour are June 29th at Karakuen with Misawa and Akiyama vs. Kobashi and Diet, Izumata and Giant Kimala 2 vs. Albright and Kauta, Tao and Tamon Honda vs. Hansen and Johnny Smith and Williams vs. Mossman June 30th at Karakuen Hall with Albright and Giant Baba vs. Misawa in Kobashi. Hansen vs. Akiyama, Diet and Williams vs. Tao and Kawada, Yoshinari Ogawa vs. Masa Fuchi for the junior title and Mossman and Rob Van Dam vs. Tu and Izamida, and July 20 at Karaku and Hall with Fuchi and Tao vs. Misawa and Kobashi, Akiyama vs. Kawada, Smith and Albright and Hansen vs. Diet and Williams and Ace, and the 4 vs. 4 survival match listed last week. June 9th TV show did a 2.1 rating. New Japan Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka won the IWGP tag titles from Shinya Hashimoto and Junji Hirata in the semi-final on June 12 in Osaka. Yamazaki suffered a broken finger the previous night. The challengers were destroyed almost the entire match. At one point Hashimoto gave Yamazaki such a beating that he was getting destroyed for five minutes, with Hirata using one finishing move after another on him. When Hirata went for his machine suplex, suddenly Yamazaki caught the left arm and gained the submission in 1626. Hashimoto had retained the IWGP heavyweight belt on June 11, beating Satoshi Kojima after Kojima missed a moonsault and Hashimoto used his DDT in 1151. Next tour is June 23rd to July 17 with the Road Warriors and Brad Armstrong on the entire tour, and the giant Ric Flair, Randy Savage, and Lex Luger there for the final two shows. There is very serious talk about WCW doing the Starcade pay-per-view in December live from Tokyo. Other Japan Notes In what in Japan is actually one of the biggest stories of the week, obviously the Murdoch news is the biggest story, Kiyoshi Tamura of UWFI, whose contract just expired, signed with rings and debuts on June 29 against Dick Frey. Tamura, who is 26, has genuine superstar potential and will be along with Yoshihisa Yamamoto, the two wrestlers that carry rings in the future. In an attempt to regain face, Koji Kao will face Geza Coleman Jr. in a UFC rules match on June 26 at Karakuen Hall. It's being billed as a Valley Tudo match and Kiao's previous Valley Tudo match was clearly legit since he basically got the hell beat out of him. Three different Japanese animal rights groups are heavily protesting the idea of bringing in Terrible Ted, the wrestling bear, for the next Big Japan tour. IWA officially held a press conference on June 11 announcing two shows combined with ECW for August 10 at Yokohama Bunka Gym and August 11 at Karakuen Hall. Paul Heyman will come to Japan along with seven ECW wrestlers, including both the heavyweight and tag team champions who will defend their titles. The show will probably draw super heat at Karakuen Hall, although I'm a little more skeptical about Yokohama. Hector Garza was in Japan this week for Wrestle Dream Factory twice putting over NWA junior champ Masayoshi Motegi. After the first match Garza was hospitalized missing a move, most likely his corkscrew plancha to the floor, but actually wrestled again a few days later. Tokyo Pro Wrestling fired Mr. Pogo, or at least that was what was announced, so the June 24th loser leaves the promotion match with Abdullah the Butcher was cancelled. Instead, Sabu will wrestle Abdullah in the main event but the loser leaves steps have been dropped. 
TPW is now looking to build to a feud where Watsumat 2 Cold Scorpio under a mask will have Abdullah as his manager against Sabu with Sheik as his manager. The Golden Cups of UWFI have their first show July 28th in Kobe with Yoji Enjo vs. Kazushi Sakuraba and 200% Machine, I still don't know who he is, against Nobuiko Takata. If either Sakuraba or Takata lose, they have to join the Golden Cups team. FMW will promote a major show on August 1st at the Shai Dome in Tokyo with Megumi Kudo in another electric explosive barbed wire match. Correction from the June 10th issue. We reported that the June 2nd Big Japan show in Nagaoka drew 1,000 fans, but in actuality there were fewer than 200. Both Jia and JWP packed Karakuen Hall for afternoon and evening shows on June 16th. AJW helped both groups, as Asia Kong beat Hiromi Yagi on the JWP card, and Mima Shimoda and Tashio Yamada worked the Jia show. Yamada was patterned totally after a young Chigusa Nagio right down to losing a famous hair match. They worked a tag match in the main event with Yamada and Gia's Mako Satomura losing to Nagio and Toshie Numa to build to a singles match between the two. In a strange booking deal one week before the June 22nd Champions Night, both tag teams in the main event did jobs on the June 15th show in Omiya as Kyoko and Takako Inoue lost a non-title to Yamada and Atsuko Mita, and Manami Toyota and Hishimoto lost to Mariko Yoshida and Kaoru Ito. Basically sets up both winning teams for future title matches. War's biggest show of the week was June 15th in Hakata before 2600 with the final match of the feud with Hiramichi Fuyuki and Geno and Jado beating Anjo and Yoshihiro Takayama and 200% Machine, subbing for injured Kenichi Yamamoto. No octopuses in this match, but after the match, Fuyuki and Anjo shook hands and said they were going to form a tag team to feud with Tenryu. Mitsuhiro Matsunaga, Killer Iwam and Yukari Ishikura are all through with FMW. The latter two are due to injuries. Matsunaga, it was announced, has quit the promotion. Michinoku is doing an angle where longtime rivals Great Sasuke and Super Delphin are going to form a tag team. Kickboxer Rene Rosa from Holland, who is 2 0 in K1 and worked for Rings in 1993, debuts for UWFI on June 26 against Sakuraba. He's also done several UFC type shoot shows in Holland. ECW. Only show of the week was June 14 in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. Crowd was way down, ECW having reported it as 385. The Paul Verlin's Jason Helton shoot fights don't look realistic at all. Sandman didn't appear to be able to work, although part of it is an angle where he comes to the ring on crutches and tries to work rather than forfeit the match, and lost quickly to Taz. Taz also choked out the ref and Todd Gordon, and Bill Alfonso choked out Missy Hyatt. Eliminators beat Gangstas in a tag title match which was their best match so far, with much better heat than Philadelphia. Main event saw Raven beat Tommy Dreamer to keep the ECW title. Raven juiced heavy and the match wound up as a bloodbath. They brawled in the parking lot. Bruce Brothers and Brian Lee all interfered and Axel Rotten ended up turning heel at the end by counting the pinfall after the ref was KO'd despite seeing all the interference. Perry Saturn was shooting a House of Pain MTV video this past week. Upcoming lineups are June 21st in Plymouth meeting Pennsylvania with Sabu vs. Shane Douglas, Dreamer and Gangsters vs. Lee and Bruce Brothers, Pitbull No. 2 vs. Saturn for TV title, Sandman and Gordon vs. Taz and Alfonso, Chris Jericho vs. Rob Van Dam and more. June 22nd Hardcore Heaven at ECW Arena is Sabu vs. Van Dam, Taz vs. Verlins, Pitbull No. 2 vs. Jericho for TV title, Eliminators vs. Bruce Brothers for tag title, Douglas vs. Mikey Whipwreck, Dreamer vs. Lee and the Samoan Gangsta Party, Matthew and Samula Anoya will work. June 29th in Middletown, New York has Raven vs. Sandman for the title, Eliminators vs. Gangsters for tag title, Dreamer vs. Lee Weapons match, Pitbull No. 2 vs. Jericho for TV title and Douglas vs. Whipwreck. June 30th in Deer Park, New York at the Community Center has Raven vs. Dreamer for the title, Pitbull No. 2 vs. Douglas for TV title and Brian Pillman will be at that show. Here and there. Lots of sad news to report. Ivan Kalmakov, real name Edward Bruce, passed away on June 10th after a heart attack in Farmington Hills, Michigan at the age of 78. Ivan and Karl Kalmakov were a famous Russian tag team in the 50s and early 60s who were, of course, not actually either Russian or brothers. Ivan actually started wrestling in the early 1940s before serving in the Navy in World War II and did the Russian gimmick several years after the war when the Cold War heated up. Karl Kalmakov died of a heart attack at a young age and Ivan continued to wrestle, but was better known from the mid-60s through around 1978 as the manager of the mighty Igor, Dick Garza, who did a Polish strongman gimmick later copied and taken to greater heights by a younger Ivan Putsky. 
Ken Farber, a referee in the Old West Texas Territory passed away back on Memorial Day weekend. Billy Red Lyons, who was a popular wrestler around the world and later became an office assistant for both Frank and later Jack Tunney in Toronto, he appeared as one of the road agents in numerous WWF angles up until the Tunney slash WWF split, suffered a serious stroke this past week and has lost some of his motor skills. Our records have Lyons as being 71 years old. The story on the AWA is that they are doing shows on July 8th and August 10th in Rochester, Minnesota and trying to sell shows based on the name. While Vern Gagne is listed as president, I'm told they are just giving Vern a cut in exchange for using his and the AWA name to sell the shows. The World Freestyle Fighting Show scheduled for June 8th was moved to June 22nd. Because of the date, Guy Mesger can't compete since he's got Pancrase on June 25th.